In this Meet the Wayfinder series, you'll hear from a variety of professionals and parents who have taken different routes to overcome breastfeeding advocacy barriers. All of the participants share their personal responses to three questions. When were they first exposed to breastfeeding? Were they surprised to discover barriers to breastfeeding, particularly in their field? And how have they overcome, transformed, or moved beyond these barriers? To fully enjoy the Meet the Wayfinder series, you can watch this overview featuring highlights from the individual interviews. You can also find links to the full interviews, which range from 15 to 30 minutes each. And you will receive through the conference registration a link to the PDF that accompanies this series. Don't worry if you miss a resource I mentioned during the presentation. All of the resources presented are found with hyperlinks in this PDF. In a moment, we will meet our wayfinders, but first, let's take a look at a few reasons cultural change can be difficult and why it is easy to stay in a hamster wheel as advocates. We'll then see how the wayfinders do things differently. What keeps us in a hamster wheel of advocacy, feeling like we're running, moving, and shaking, but then not getting anywhere? First, our modern dominator culture's prominent feature, as Darshan Narvaj shows us, is competitive detachment. Our current culture does not value listening, relational skills, or inner awareness. All are necessary to support and appreciate diversity, inclusion, sustainable living, and a whole child wellness model. Second, our current culture values convergent thinking only working with known quantities that keep us moving inside of known power structures that continue unsustainable ways of living and patterns of systemic oppression. Third, our responses to these external forces through traditional activism are reactionary, meaning we wait until a problem is overwhelming, our senses, time, and energies to acknowledge it. And then we protest, march, and express our outrage in social media campaigns. This sort of traditional activism has its place, but it is not how real change is made according to our Wayfinder stories. Fourth, existing institutional structures are usually too compromised, conflicted, and insular to fully embody new values and visions. Parallel structures are needed for this purpose. And fifth, because our current culture expects conformity in the box thinking and traditional reactionary after the fact activism, there's nothing new to integrate into the old way of being, thinking, and existing culturally. This way of being, of waiting for external forces to change and support individual and collective wellness, is no longer necessary. Let's be like this little guy and just stop running ourselves ragged in a way of advocacy that gets us nowhere. How did our wayfinders create change? Where did most of our wayfinders begin? They begin by listening to inner guidance that questions and re-envisions the environment of their day-to-day -day lives. Cecilia Tamori questions her doctor's advice for infant sleep, and her questioning leads her, as she shows in her story, from zero understanding of breastfeeding to becoming a breastfeeding expert. When we follow a call to investigate and create a different reality for ourselves and others, this process is called following or answering the call. It is recognized as the beginning of a hero's journey, a point of departure to a personal transformation in perception and awareness. The second hallmark is divergent thinking. Divergent thinking calls upon our capacity to think outside the box, to use our imaginations, and to see the big picture. The third hallmark is kindred activism. This theory of activism involves centering the needs of children in social justice work while valuing the inner skills of mindfulness and outer skills of relational activism. The fourth hallmark of successful barrier breaking is the creation of a parallel structure or an organizational structure that supports the embodiment of the values and vision of wayfinders who are following the call to create a new reality alongside the old reality and its structures. Examples of these parallel structures are La Leche League International, Attachment Parenting International, Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, and Reaching Our Brothers Everywhere. And finally, listen for how the new insight, communities, and vision are strategically integrated into openings in the old reality, 
ideas, and structures. Sometimes in creative ways, like Darshan Narvaez's new short film, Breaking the Cycle, which features 40 years of integrated siloed fields of science into a six minute video. You'll also hear Kathleen O'Malley's story of the creation of her play Milk Drunk, which addresses both her internal and external struggles with breastfeeding barriers. All of our presenters address the opportunities awaiting us in our post-pandemic world and how with an understanding of the hallmarks of successful barrier breaking, we can be ready to introduce and integrate a new way forward. And now let's meet our wayfinders. We'll start with Cecilia Tamori, the Director of Global Public Health at Johns Hopkins, whose breastfeeding advice from her physician led her to investigate, as she says, the patterns of small interactions that are a part of the larger biomedical culture bias against breastfeeding and its relationship to the 150-year history of formula industry influence. Darshan Narvaez is a professor of psychology emerita at the University of Notre Dame. Raised as a bilingual, bicultural child, Darsha's early life experiences led her to the question why children thrived in some countries, but were undercared for and sickly in other countries, especially the richest countries in the world, the United States and the United Kingdom. Darsha's book, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom, was chosen for the Vatican's 2017 Expanded Reason Award from among more than 360 entries and 30 countries. You can find Darsha's work at the Evolve Nest Initiative online, and you can join live ongoing discussions about the Evolve Nest latest film project, Breaking the Cycle. Stay tuned after this interview to watch the six minute film. Dr. Kamari Bug is the founder and president of Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere. She is a winner of multiple Lifetime Achievement Awards and has dedicated 40 years of her professional nursing career to decreasing breastfeeding disparities in the African-American community. She has also worked with local and national organizations to transform hospital culture, educate medical practitioners and nurses, and more recently, her organization, Rose, is taking on the state of Georgia in ongoing litigation for its disenfranchising and oppressive lactation support provider laws. Described by the New York Times Magazine as having something approaching rock star status in her field, Joan C. Williams has played a central role in reshaping the conversation around work, gender, and class over the past quarter century. Williams is a distinguished professor of law, Hastings Foundation chair, and founding director of the Center for Work-Life Law. Williams' pathbreaking work helped create the field of work family studies and modern workplace flexibility policies. Where were you when the May 2012 Time Magazine cover featuring Los Angeles mother, Jamie Grumet and her three and a half year old son broke through airways and our collective consciousness to help us imagine our species full term breastfeeding norm. It's been nearly a decade since the cover shot heard around the world. Today, magazines regularly praise and feature celebrities nursing their babies and social media is deluged with breastfeeding toddlers. In her new book, Modern Attachment Parenting, Jamie shares insights from the fallout around the Time Magazine cover as well as a compassionate field tested review of attachment science and the context of modern American life. The book features a forward by Alanis Morissette and an introduction by attachment parenting founder, Dr. William Sears. Wesley Bug is the chief operating officer of Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, Rose, and the director of Reaching Our Brothers Everywhere. Robe's mission is to educate, equip, and empower men to impact an increase in breastfeeding rates and a decrease in infant mortality rates within the African-American communities. You can meet the men of Robe in Kindred's four-part oral history series, Standing at the Intersection of Fatherhood, Infant Mortality, Breastfeeding, and Social Justice at kindredmedia.org. Stay tuned at the end of the interview with Wesley to watch two robe videos, one animated video on postpartum care for mothers, and one hilarious video for dads of a toddler's intergender nipple confusion. 
you can visit Robe at breastfeedingrobe.org. Jay Shalonyan's Echo Heart is a birth worker, student midwife, and co-founder of the Indigenous Milk Medicine Week, celebrated the second week of National Breastfeeding Month in August. In her play, Milk Drunk, Kathleen O'Malley integrates her education in theater, women's studies, the social and therapeutic application of the arts, and her early experience of motherhood. As Kathleen shares, the play is the result of her need to explore both inner and outer barriers to breastfeeding her first child, including the lack of support for family life in the arts. Patty Cornwolf is one of the founding directors and mentoring mothers of Kindred World, an American grassroots nonprofit founded a quarter century ago by parents and professionals advocating for holistic wellness models and family friendly policies. The consciousness raising nonprofit was found in the middle of America's 50 year decline to the bottom of all developed nations' rankings for child wellness, according to the United Nations. Today, Kindred World still exists in many initiatives, including the Kindred Media Initiative producing the Meet the Wayfinder series. Today, Patty is a labor and delivery nurse with three grown children. When she is not tending to moms and babies, she travels the country with her husband in search of the best rock climbing and mountaintop views. I'm Lisa Reagan, editor of Kindred Media and co-founder of Kindred World. Kindred Media is a nonprofit initiative and alternative media platform. I'm honored to be invited to produce the Meet the Wayfinder series, Breaking Barriers in Breastfeeding Advocacy for La Leche League International's 65th Anniversary Conference. Now let's meet our Wayfinders. Well, um, I grew up in Hungary, I'm Hungarian, and people in Hungary generally tend to breastfeed. And so, you know, it was just sort of understood that people breastfeed. I didn't really actually see it much, but it was something that was sort of surrounding the air. So, you know, I definitely come from a culture where breastfeeding is sort of taken for granted, although um, with the medicalization of breastfeeding, communities lost knowledge about how it actually worked. Later on, so, you know, I think as I myself became a mother in the U.S., so I was a relatively recent immigrant, you know, I, I learned English by then. I didn't know English growing up, um, but I had to, you know, learn the entire system, right? So it's not just, you know, learning a language, it's learning the entire cultural context and, you know, the interaction with the medical system. In Hungary, I grew up in a system that was very authoritative. You're supposed to follow the instruction of the medical provider. And, and in the setting that I grew up in, which was, you know, under the Iron Curtain, mind you, so in occupation and not exactly a wealthy system, you know, if you wanted to get care, at that particular time, you really needed to follow those instructions or you may actually not get care at all. So there was this very uh, straightforward relationship, like you were really trying to get the care that you needed and you were sort of at the mercy of the provider who was you know, considered to be the authority. And then you know, you're just trying to make your way through it. It's not, not exact, you know, this is what it's like growing up in a, in a middle income country, it's, it's challenging. So I uh, assume that these kinds of relations were similar in the US having no idea, you know, any of the historical background, you know, none of the research, I didn't know any of that. And so learning about breastfeeding in the US, I just assumed, you know, I was going to breastfeed and, and someone was going to like tell me how to do it, right? <laughs> And I was uh, mistaken. So, you know, when I when I ended up giving birth to my first son, um, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no real support. Uh, you know, my mom had breastfed, but like I said, she didn't really know what she was doing either. Because by that time, you know, in the seventies in Hungary, you know, the medical providers were not exactly helpful. So she had some struggles of her own. My husband obviously had never, you know, dealt with breastfeeding and he didn't come from a breastfeeding family. So it was complete cluelessness. And they of course sent us home with a formula pack 
at that time it was still you know the the most common practice and so <laughs> so we arrive at home and you know the doctor basically i mean they gave us the formula so i assumed that you know you're supposed to do whatever the doctor says right so it wasn't working very well you know i was very sore it was unclear if my baby was getting food you know i had no literally and i mean zero you know so you know it's from zero to the breastfeeding expert it's a quite a steep curve there but um no idea what i was doing and so i actually told my husband you know i think we should just use formula i mean they send it home with us right and so my husband who again came from a non-breastfeeding family was like you know honey let me just check some books <laughs> and so he who um you know, like I said, really with no personal experience, the only saving grace that I think we had is that we both had a biology major from college, which did help to conceptualize the idea of mammals. You know, I think that was helpful and that I came from a setting, you know, that did breastfeed, but again, very little understanding. So he picked up a book at a bookstore, brought it home and started reading about breastfeeding and was like, you know, I, I don't actually think we should use formula. <laughs> And I thought, bummer. <laughs> you know? I guess I should try some more. And so once we started learning a little bit, we were, I think, set on this path, right? Obviously, of learning how to do breastfeeding. And, and eventually we kind of figured it out. Um, but yeah, the barriers were, were numerous, including our physician who was uh, not exactly supportive. And when we were trying to figure out sleep and you know, you, you know, and obviously your audience will probably know that I've written about breastfeeding and infant sleep before, when we were trying to deal with that with our own child, um, our physician told us that we should not feed the baby overnight. And that if we do, this is at our um, six week visit, then it's sort of like um, encouraging our child to wake up for pizza at night. We're training him to wake up. And, you know, I remember walking out of that appointment thinking, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted, right? I just had a baby six weeks ago. The baby doesn't sleep that much, you know? And personally, you'd have to like pay me a lot of money to wake up to eat pizza at three in the morning. It is not something that I'd be motivated to do unless I really needed it. And so, you know, I think these kinds of encounters um, helped me realize how powerful the barriers were, but it was really not until I started studying it that I realized, you know, the extent of them. So it was, it was really after getting into this through uh, graduate work in anthropology that I started realizing how pervasive barriers were and how they were historically structured. And that's really where my interest led me ultimately is, is investigating these kinds of smaller interactions, realizing that they fit into a much larger historical pattern and that I wanted to know what those patterns were, what was driving them, and what we could do to change them. You know, over time, that is an interest that became much stronger for me. I think I started with these smaller barriers and then realized that they led down a particular path. And so really, you know, investigating medical authority and the, the kind of power and, and influence the culture of biomedicine has had over infant feeding was sort of a first step. But then as I read more, it became clear that part of the issue was that health professionals were what we call are captured by the industry. And I think that piece was uh, very illuminating. So once you start seeing that the way in which biomedicine has become dominant had a powerful influence and in undermining breastfeeding, but that influence was hand in hand with the industry. And so industry interests were to expand markets and to expand profits from the get-go. The idea that these industries were sort of altruistic really needs to be questioned because when you look at the historical documents from the early, early part, you know, I was reading some of these documents where, you know, Nestle, who was one of the major 
players and one of the, the key founders of the industry actually had this financial relationship with the local physician for that particular canton who basically wrote this treatise you know, that Nestle published that suggested that women's milk was insufficient, that mothers could not possibly feed their babies adequately. And that really, you know, after maybe, if, if they could feed them at all, you know, after a few weeks, that this was insufficient. And of course, the solution that they needed was this product, right? And the product was Nestle's product. And I think once you see how this kind of framing goes all the way back to the beginning of the industry, then you start realizing that it didn't matter what that product was and how adequate that was or how, um, you know, actually well it would have served as a potential substitute because it was in no way adequate or comparable. But the point was to establish it as something that people believed it to be equal because that's what created that market. And then they took that market global. And I think that was also just such a sordid, terrible history. So, so they're undermining breastfeeding, you know, particularly in initially marketing it to people who are elite women who were already often um, hiring other people and in other settings, obviously, you know, exploiting people in different forms, you know, through enslavement and, and servitude to feed their babies. So elite women had this kind of special situation and they were a very, uh, quote unquote, useful market for this kind of propaganda about how milk was, their milk was inadequate and they just couldn't feed the baby and they needed this product. What they were trying to do at that point is undermine wet nursing as an institution. That was, that was how they were creating their market. But that didn't stop with this particular group of people. They took that market to everywhere, including you know, through colonial relationships that they were establishing because colonialism is all about exploiting people and using people's labor and extracting the maximum possible profit. And so what they did then was use a network of healthcare providers to drive that market and establish them as an authoritative source. So they did symposia, scientific symposia. They hired either real healthcare providers or even fake healthcare providers later on, dressed up later on as, as nurses in maternity wards. But the point was to use healthcare providers as a source of authority to essentially drive their market and establish it as you know, the norm to displace breastfeeding globally. And that occurred in all these different colonial settings around the world. And you know, I've written a little popular piece about that, but you know, the historical research on this is extremely interesting and strong and you know, led by you know, actual historians. I'm not a historian, I'm an anthropologist, but I use that work to make the arguments that I make about the larger forces of barriers. So you really need to see that historical evolution to understand how profound the influence of the industry is, how much they're driving this market and how they use um, whatever the local situation is, you know, the vulnerabilities of that particular setting, the work conditions that people may face that make it difficult for women to incorporate children into their lives. You know, in the US, obviously, the complete lack of paid uh, leave for parents is a great opportunity. These are all marketing opportunities. And then, you know, like I said, the complex ways in which that market actually gets expanded involves a series of other ways of, of seeking authority. And so healthcare professionals are a key way in to these kinds of markets. And essentially people are being misled, systematically misled by the industry that uh, their products are equal or potentially even superior to breastfeeding. Um, and they make people feel as if they were insufficient, you know, just like in the 19th century, some of these uh, texts that I cited earlier, 
made people feel vulnerable because they were told that their milk was inadequate and that they needed this product. Um, that is a strategy that has been pervasive. You know, the marketing strategies make you feel like what you're doing is not enough, that you're not feeding that baby adequately or that, you know, they're up at night because of breastfeeding. And these kinds of strategies are really powerful when you're exhausted and you have very little support. So, you know, as a, as a parent, certainly I'm quite familiar with that vulnerability. So as an anthropologist, what do you see uh, the value of, uh, you know, this, this presentation is for La Leche League Internationals Conference. And I'm thinking about my own experience of finally uh, connecting with a group of women and how I did feel empowered with these uh, connections, mostly because of having someone model for me what this looks like because I didn't know right. and then I started to kind of absorb it and feel like I uh, you know it, it I really have talked about this at conferences for years <laughs> something from being with other women sank into my DNA or something and I and I felt a, a switch flip on and I felt like okay I can do this I can do this I can do this too because I could you know you can call it monkey see monkey do somatic psychology or, or quantum physics I don't know <laughs> something happened uh, in that process of being with women that helped me to feel more confident and discerning about was I being supported or not because then I had the experience of being supported, and I knew when I wasn't being supported. So I'm just wondering if you, as an anthropologist, could speak to a moment of the value of, because we're looking at ways over, under, and through, you know, the, these barriers, and the barriers seem almost insurmountable when you're talking about you know, 100, 150 years of formula companies strategizing and marketing and billions of dollars poured into that. And then healthcare providers being trained, uh, in, as you said, captured by that system in some ways. So um, and I'm looking for where, to, where do mothers, uh, fathers go for backup um, to overcome these really powerful barriers. Well, I think that we have some good news. I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, despite enormous barriers, you can see examples of success, you know, and, and in, you know, obviously globally, we have many different kinds of examples. And I think that there's multiple different strategies that we can use to overcome the barriers. So the most powerful ones have to do with structural change, right? So one way that we do this, you know, in anthropology and in public health, because I'm in both in anthropology and public health, I think uh, those of us who work in this arena, we recognize that the most powerful effects are at that structural policy level. So you can change policies to facilitate uh, breastfeeding, to create an enabling environment, and to limit the kind of unbridled marketing efforts of these companies. So it, it, they do not need to be given free reign. You know, we can actually implement the World Health Organization's code, the International Marketing Code of Breast Milk Substitutes. So we can actually do that. And, and there are examples of that. There's also other kind of structural changes that we can make, which are you know, having to do with, for example, healthcare providers, healthcare provider training, and you know, uh, baby-friendly hospital initiatives that aren't supposed to stop at the hospital. We're not quite as good as uh, at taking some of those steps out of the hospital, but within the hospital, we've had pretty good success at changing the ways that things are done. For example, the fact that it's no longer routine in many hospitals to send people home with formula packs. I mean that, you know, like in my own experience, I used that formula pack for years in lectures to illustrate how pervasive those influences are and what the marketing claims were. And these kinds of things, coupled with the endorsement of a healthcare providers, can break someone's journey. But we don't have to allow that to happen if we tackle those kinds of policies. Then, you know, building on that, obviously, community support is key. Like you said, we can pour much more 
resources into that and provide skilled lactation support to people that is also equitable and accessible because that is really what we're dealing with now is that we have people who could be wonderful providers, but they're not necessarily accessible to people. They may not be culturally appropriate to the people that they need to serve. And so I think building that up would be an enormous uh, enormously successful and we have obviously examples of that kind of success. I think the other aspect of that is recognizing, you know, the built-in inequities that I talked about, you know, this history that is, you know, tied up with capitalism and colonialism from the get-go. This is why we have these profound inequities baked into the system, you know, the elite white women's experiences are very different from people for whom these systems were essentially forced upon and um, exploited systematically throughout this entire history. And so reclaiming the traditions of breastfeeding in the settings where they were systematically undermined as part of these colonial medical efforts, including of course in our own setting in the United States, I think is a very powerful way of, of speaking back to those systems. And you know, within that, the supports that we have in our communities are, are extremely effective. So what you said about, you know, something happened to you when you were watching it, we know from the scientific literature that that's actually, you know, how people learn to breastfeed, not just from the scientific literature, from really experiential uh, learning. And breastfeeding was never meant to be something learned from a textbook. It was something that is surrounding you in the community, right? So breastfeeding friendly cultures, which I would not call Hungary one of them when I was growing up, that was a partially supportive kind of cultural setting. But in, in places where breastfeeding is, uh, you know, has been the cultural norm, which was the majority of the world until fairly recently, until, you know, about 150, 200 years ago, you know, you would see breastfeeding everywhere around you and, and people around you, particularly generations of women would be knowledgeable about how to address issues, you know, and I don't want to romanticize that because I know that in some settings, people had more cultural knowledge and resources than others, but for the most part, breastfeeding worked quite well in settings that were supportive, that had these communities of women, and usually, you know, uh, midwives were in charge of the entire spectrum of childbearing, but not on their own, right? There were other people who were also knowledgeable about knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about these things. So, I think we can do much, much better in facilitating these systems of support, and we have to continue to encourage people to seek these communities out as well. But I think we can make some policy decisions about how we do things structurally and how we direct money so that we can foster these kinds of supports and provide everybody with what they deserve, which is an enabling breastfeeding environment where they can make decisions freely pre of you know industry influence and when they're properly supported in their desire to breastfeed. All right, well, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be with you and in this conversation. Well, my childhood, half of it was spent outside the United States. Within the United States, I really didn't have any experience with breastfeeding that I remember. But when we lived in uh, Mexico, Colombia, uh, spent a month in Guatemala, um, I noticed mothers were carrying their children on their backs, tied up, and I actually bought shawls when I was a teen to bring home so I could do that when I became a mother. And, uh, you know, the breastfeeding right there, all very integrated uh, way of growing a child. So I had glimpses of that. But I kind of tamped down that I had so many other interests uh, and careers. Uh, it's only in the last uh, 15 years, perhaps 20 years, uh, that I became enlightened. Uh, and that happened because I found first James Prescott's work on looking at what creates societies that are not violent, peaceful societies. And he published, uh, James Prescott was formerly of NIMH, and the, they used to have a child abuse prevention program. Mm. 
when he was there in the 70s. In his study, he looked at over 400 societies around the world that the anthropologists had documented. And he found that 80% of the variation in whether a society was peaceful or violent was due to breastfeeding and carrying a child. And I thought, whoa, what's going on there? And then I found the book, Hunter Gather Childhoods. And in there, they uh, identified breastfeeding as one of several components that we now call the evolved nest. And in there, uh, there were two shockers. One, they observed breastfeeding lasting from two to eight years. It's like, whoa. And then that the average age of weaning was four years. It's like, whoa. <laughs> all right. So just exploding information. So then it was like, wow, why? Well, what does it mean? And Melvin Connor, the anthropologist, said, hmm, these characteristics, the evolved nest, uh, maybe they're important because they're all over the world. They've been here for what, a couple millions of years. So I got intrigued. So I had to read neuroscience and had to go investigate why it's so important. Were you surprised at some of the barriers to breastfeeding you encountered in that world of academia and science and research and then presenting the science? Yes. Yes and no. Uh, no, because I think corporations have most of the power in the United States and they want to make money and the U.S.'s institutions are all set up to support that. Uh, and so it's not about well-being. It's not about children and families. And so that's the non-surprise. Uh, and it's very distressing. Um, and the United States is the only high-income country that really neglects children and families. It's just uh, appalling when you look at it from the perspective of the world. But yes, I was also uh, surprised because I have the crazy notion that if you give people information about how important this is for children's development, they'll change their behavior, they'll change their mind, they'll, you know, believe you. <laughs> but no, people will resist, you know, oh, I've never heard that before, it can't be true. Uh, that's why misinformation works so well when people hear the bad information over and over and over, they start to think it is true. And our society is filled with that kind of information, including about babies, Ah, oh, they don't need that. They're resilient, right? Ah, oh, formula is just as good. And so we hear all that over and over and over. And in my world, academia now, um, it's difficult to even, you know, bring up the fact that babies have particular needs. They'll grow into, you know, well-functioning uh, neurobiological creatures with good social skills and uh, companionship, cooperative morality. If you give them this stuff, let people, again, resist. And so we've had um, pushback from editors um, who say, oh, this can't be important. Or you can't write about breastfeeding. You can't write about infant circumcision. You're not a medical doctor. There's a lot of, um, and I, I write for psychology today, and there's pushback there as well. So a lot of lack, lack of support, lack of belief in it. I mean, the Western culture is all about training this little intellectual mind, this ivory tower mind, um, as if that's what human nature is, what being human means. And that's crazy because we're destroying everything because of that mind is so isolated, not integrated with your heart and your intuitions that uh, is part of being a human being. So this takes us to who's perceiving the message. Um, and, and, you know, at Kindred, we've always advocated for um, consumers, uh, is what they would be called in the uh, capitalist model, but, but for the family members for themselves, mothers, fathers, parents, uh, families to get the information they need. But this sounds like there's going to be a piece of, of self-awareness necessary here, which is the uh, left brain, right brain training we have in our culture to even perceive this information and to perceive it in an integrated way. Yeah, so in my work, I talk about how what we've done to childhood is we've forced people into their survival systems, which is all the triggers, you know, and you get, uh, you automatically see threat and feel uh, stressed, and you can't think when that happens. You can't feel, you can't be open, right? And we, we under care for babies. Uh, so much, so that's pretty normal. We think that's normal kind of personality to be like that, very self-oriented. 
And then we go send kids to school and we teach their left brain. You know, this little intellectual way of thinking is, you know, you create abstract models and then you apply them in the world and they have a script. But that's the normal way of, of interacting in the world. And what's missing is the heart, the sense of connection, the sense of intuition about how to get along and all this millions of little things you know about how to get along because you were immersed in a cooperative society, a connected place where they loved you and you were welcomed. That's missing for most of our children's experiences and most of the adults now in our country miss that too. And so they, they have these gaps and uh, for you to say something that doesn't fit with the script they've been taught is like, what? You know, it triggers them and then they can't hear. And so we have to heal people by you know, encouraging, welcoming, but they also have to get in touch with their own hearts and their own feelings, their own intuitions, and begin to open up that cage, that fortress that they've built around their true selves. And it takes a little pain to do that. It takes a little uh, humility, right, to let go. And then you actually, you know, the therapists say, you know, it's that you're so afraid of opening that gate, you know, and then when you finally do it, yeah, there's some pain, but boy, you're free. You feel this great freedom. So we need to help people go through the grief of letting go of the things that they missed as, as babies, as young children, and re reconnect to one another and build our communities together. Mm. Kamari Bug said um, yesterday that the key to um, this strategy, this long-term strategy of breastfeeding advocacy is community and to focus on the oxytocin you get from that, like the oxytocin you get from bonding with babies and breastfeeding. So uh, that's our fuel we can look forward to sustaining us through this transition that's individual, as you're saying, and collective. So... So you did this amazing uh, work of integrating the science. And this is one of the problems that parents face when they are trying to use their left brain to navigate wellness. And somehow in our instincts, uh, you know, Joseph Chilton Pierce has called it the biocultural conflict that we feel conflicted in trying to meet our children's biological imperatives in a culture that has other imperatives. Uh, and then to try to find a whole child wellness model to help us through this, uh, uh, this is what the evolved nest is. So can you tell me a little bit about the integration of these, the siloed science into the evolved nest? Right, as I said, I discovered James Prescott and I discovered the anthropologist and I just I had to go into neuroscience and I had to go into developmental neuroscience and clinical science for the outcomes of what, and then pull all those things together plus other things to realize that if you're going to build a well-functioning, happy, cooperative human being, you've got to pay attention to a whole bunch of things, and especially meeting the basic needs of babies, meeting the basic needs of mothers and babies, meeting the basic needs of children as they grow and change and need other kinds of support. And the Evolve Nest is about that. It's, we all need to be nested throughout our lives. Uh, and so these uh, components shift in what it, it, it exactly looks like. And I initially started writing about these things at my Psychology Today blog post, um, posting things. They've gotten resistant now because I think they get money from formula companies and crib companies, and they don't want to hear about, they banned talking about infant circumcision, <laughs> for example, even though I have several uh, posts up that have millions of hits. Uh, so, um, and then you discovered, uh, we connected, Lisa, and you have helped uh, put together Evolve Nest initiative. EvolveNest.org is part of Kindred World, Kindred Media, and that's been marvelous. So we are creating all sorts of um, tools for people to use in various ways. So can you tell, uh, tell us about Breaking the Cycle, this little short film that's packed so much science into it, the integrated science and the evolved nest, 
and the language that you're using in there that we're in a cycle of competitive detachment and we need to work back towards and this piece I found people are really amazed to discover 95% of our human history we were a peaceful species um, and we want to work back towards the cycle of cooperative companionship um, which uh, you show us a path is is possible but not without some awareness and some work. So can you tell us about this, which I, I again, view as this lovely creative over, around, and under the barrier <laughs> uh, message? Well, it comes out of my book, uh, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom, which was published in 2014. And it's won a couple of uh, major awards. And it's, uh, the book was kind of dense. I mean, it's really important and good stuff, you know, but uh, it's, it's a lot to read, you know? And so it just, we came up with this idea to have something quick where people get the message. Uh, it's uh, heart-centered, it uh, touches you. I always cry when I watch it, uh, no matter how many times I watch it. Uh, and it's intended to give you that, that holistic view, that early experience uh, matters for shaping a good psychosocial neurobiology, which then leads to wellness, well-being, and actually wisdom in the adults who are supported in this way. And then that leads to a, a culture. They build a culture that meets basic needs, is you know, flexibly attuned to one another and to the needs of children. And then that cycle keeps going. That's the cooperative companionship that is not, we used to be normal all over the world. And we've sh shifted and slipped into undercare for the young uh, where, you know, we kind of minimize the needs of babies. Ah, they don't need, wow, they're resilient, right? And oh, let's what, get their burden off the parents, you know? That's just been around for quite a long time, at least 150 years in the USA, getting worse almost sometimes in some places, sometimes better. And then that leads to a, a, a poorly functioning neurobiology and sociality and morality. You're just regulated in so many different ways. Your immune system, your endocrine system, your oxytocin system doesn't work very well, depending on when that neglect or undercare occurred. And then the adults are kind of sickly and not well and don't get along that well and kind of ornery and oppositional or they're withdrawn. And then they create the culture that continues the cycle. They're overwhelmed or over controlling or under controlling and neglectful or, you know, just everything's so dysregulated. And what looks good then is to grab everything you can. You're told uh, the world is a dog eat dog world. And so then you grab, you know, and, and you feel like you're competing all the time because you never feel quite right. And you have no, and then you've been taught the, the stories about competition, that's what you have to do in life. And you feel so afraid all the time with triggers and everything uh, because your heart is underdeveloped. Uh, and so that's where we are. We're in this kind of mess of um, dysregulation and then destruction at the same time of uh, one another, ourselves, one another and the planet. Mm. Well, there seems like an opportunity uh, with the pandemic being here. Uh, people are rethinking all sorts of uh, ways of being that we just said were normal and, and rethinking what is normal because it doesn't look like we're going to be going back to that anyway. So uh, I know that um, on the, the breakingthecyclefilm.org site, there is a film guide, discussion questions. There's a Spanish version of the film, and it also has been translated into 15 languages on uh, subtitles and on the YouTube version. So this is a, uh, uh, we, we have tried to make it as easy <laughs> for people to pick it up and, and go with it and hang on to the, um, hang on to, to the message and also join Darsha in monthly discussion groups, live ones to ask questions. So this is a, a really amazing tool and it is based on your, uh, your work, your, your, I, at the beginning of your, of this, uh, we'll show the pictures of you as this bicultural bilingual child traveling the world and uh, to see the foundation that instilled in you this curiosity and also inspired you to, to come up with this amazing, helpful messaging and advocacy. Thank you so much, Darsha. Thank you. Thank, thank you.
So what, where did you, where was the turning point when you decided to get organized and start reaching our sisters everywhere? So I had for many years um, as a professional nurse that, you know, worked in the hospital and then at, at a state level and then at, a, at a, a private pediatric practice, then a school of medicine. But all during all of that time, I had always continued to help breastfeeding women. Um, there are many women that would come to my house and sit on my sofa at two o'clock in the morning. So it's something I've always done, but not sort of um, organized. And so after um, a, a, I, I left the School of Medicine, um, I was what they call right-sized, um, but, you know, let go uh, with a severance package. Um, I decided that, you know what, I I'm just really want to do this full time. Um, and so we started reaching our sisters everywhere in 2011. And you've told us before on Kindred about uh, trying to reach back into the hospital administration and some of the barriers there with uh, hanging a poster at a nurse's station, for example, or someplace and saying, oh, well, if you, here's your meeting and if you don't come to it, that's on you. And then you were expressing how this is not the relational way of the black community that you were a part of and was actually offensive. And so that was not going to work. A poster, something impersonal, something that didn't relate to you know, a human, human contact. What, yeah. did, what did Rose, how did you start addressing that piece? So, so you, what we used to hear so often is, you know, why won't these people come to the breastfeeding support group? You say that they need support, but they won't come. I've put this flyer on the wall. Everybody can see it when they walk by. Our community is truly built on relationships. Um, you know, it, it's about reaching out to to. Uh, mothers and saying, you know, this is a uh, group that that is for you. We want you to come to this group and we can talk about and work through your breastfeeding concerns. And again, that's something that we did that was really very successful um, to do some uh, specific reaching out and say that your experiences are important to us and we want to hear about them and we want you to be in community with other other uh, women who um, have had babies and who are breastfeeding. And so it was just, again, it's about building those relationships. Yeah, as with all of this stuff, I had an extremely tough time with issues related to motherhood. I almost dropped out as uh, a tenured law professor after my second child was born because it was just so overwhelming. And I just thought like, this is completely crazy. If somebody as focused and driven as me is being driven out of the workplace, this is like almost impossible. This is crazy. I'm going to put a stop to this. I didn't, but I think I've helped somewhat. Um, with respect to breastfeeding, as in all other ways, I was one of the lucky ones. Um, I wasn't lucky in the sense that I never really managed to pump. I just couldn't get it to work. But I was super lucky because I, I lived very close to where I worked. And so I literally would drive back home and nurse like twice in the middle of the workday, um, which, you know, most people, I was very, one of the reasons I started to work on motherhood is I had a very tough pregnancies as well. And was uh, really, um, the first trimesters were pretty awful. And I realized, you know, I would be fired if I had a real job, um, if I wasn't a professor. Uh, I always say being a professor is better than working. Um, uh, I, I worked very hard, but, um, but I would have been fired if I, during, during my first pregnancy, if, if I had um, had an ordinary um, you know, uh, job, not a professor job. So um, I began to work on issues related to motherhood and um, it, at first it was very simple. I mean, mothers were literally being fired and told there was because it was told it was because they were mothers and federal courts were saying that is, was not illegal, that that was not gender discrimination. 
And the very first thing that um, work life law did is like, we said like, yes, it is. It is gender discrimination. We documented that it's like the strongest form of gender discrimination. Um, and we turned that law around. For, for years, I would not work on breastfeeding because the focus of work life law has always been to kind of grab rights where nobody thinks they exist under current law. Because my sense when I founded Work Life Law in the 1990s was that there was not going to be any federal leg legislation that was going to be helpful. And you know how much federal legislation, Lisa, there has been that's helpful? None. So we have always focused on grabbing rights where people thought there were none. And for a long time, until just within the past five years, um, the federal courts were saying, I, can't, I know you will not believe this, um, being a non-lawyer, but the Pregnancy Discrimination Act dis um, prohibits discrimination based on pregnancy and related medical conditions. And bless their hearts, federal courts were saying that nursing was not a related medical condition related to pregnancy. It's like, okay. Um, so that, I, I didn't work on it because there was just, you know, there was no room to maneuver. But immediately when uh, federal courts um, started to join the human race and understand that nursing was a medical condition related to pregnancy, um, we, we began to go after those rights um, with very generous support from the Kellogg Foundation. And one of the things that we have found, um, you know, I've been running Work Life Law for 25 years now, a num is a real shift, um, a, a lot uh, many of the people in foundations, as you know, are women, and many of them are young women, and many of them are mothers. And when we first started to raise money for this, people thought we were crazy. <laughs> Don't you want to help get people get pe women in blue collar jobs? Like, well, that's great, but no, we work on motherhood. Well, motherhood is about choice, not about discrimination. Well, excuse me, choice and discrimination aren't mutually ex exclusive categories. But now, um, luckily, there are a number of young women uh, who have gone through all of this, who work in um, private foundations, and that's, um, they've been wonderfully supportive to us. And the Kellogg Foundation has been fabulous, such an amazing supporter. Before that, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation um, funded us for almost a decade. Do you see the quarantine COVID and the way the, the world is changing right now as an opportunity for this uh, to, to pick up momentum, the work that you're doing to advocate for women's rights in the workplace? Well, you know, as somebody who won us one of the original work family people um, who literally helped invent and disseminate one of the key work family policies in law firms and and was one of the generation that invented workplace flexibility policies. I had actually stopped working on them because I, there, I just saw no progress as of three years ago, two years ago. And COVID, horrible as it has been, um, and you know, a lot of people have died, it's been awful, um, has really pushed the work family arena. Um, in a very, um, I mean, we always said it's only a failure of imagination that's keeping back remote work. And you know what was keeping back remote work, Lisa? A failure of imagination that was remedied in about three weeks flat um, last March, you know, March in 2020. And all of a sudden, so many people were working remote. Um, and so that's a big step forward. Um, and the fact that many, many employers are now considering hybrid work schedules where only some days a week are on site has the potential to really help working mothers. Um, people of color too, by the way, who are far more likely to want to continue remote than white people are. So we're really at one of these moments of great opportunity, but there's also an accompanying risk because if we have a scenario where women and people of color are much more likely to choose to continue with remote work, whereas you know, your basic white guy is on site full time and employers don't manage this carefully, you're going to have the people who are working remote even more disadvantaged 
by the fact that they're out of sight, out of mind. And so we published an article in Harvard Business Review just in the last couple of weeks that provides some guidance on, and we have a full toolkit on the www.biasinterrupters.org website to help employers manage successfully the transition to hybrid work so that it actually enhances their diversity and inclusion goals rather than undermines them. That's just excellent, Joan. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you would like for the conference attendees to know about your work before we go? Um, just that I thank all of the conference attendees who dedicated their time to making it so that women can breastfeed and making it so that women can breastfeed their children and support their children. Because, you know, for me, I've loved my career and I've just love being a mother, loved having babies. And the fact that women should have to sacrifice one or the other makes no sense. So thank you all. I was first exposed to breastfeeding because I was breastfed until I was around five or six. We don't really know when I weaned, but it was just a natural part of what my family did. Mostly, I think it was just me. My mom didn't breastfeed my sister for very long or my brother, but by the time she had me, she was a little bit older. Um, and so she, she wanted to kind of do things on her terms and she thought that that was right. So when you got older with all of this normalizing of breastfeeding at a young age, were you surprised at, to find that there were barriers to breastfeeding? Um, I think that I didn't understand the social stigma that was attached to it because it was so normal in my family. Uh, I knew that some people found breastfeeding toddlers or you know children weird, but I didn't think anybody really said anything to to one another. Um, and so that that upset me to think about you know especially after all of the the awful things that people had said to me after the time cover, the thought of women actually getting that in their from their close family and friends all the time. It was just um, really upsetting to me and, and really, it hurt me to think about them because I had a support system, um, you know, that, that made all the difference for, for my breastfeeding journey with both my kids. So were, do you think that being breastfed uh, for the full term breastfeeding length, as they would say, um, as a child influenced your decision to do the cover for time? Oh yeah, I think that it was just, it's such a normal thing. And it was, I, I started a blog really to, to um, share my journey with my family um, about our adoption process. And just in, through people commenting and other moms, you know, communicating to me through comments, I started realizing a lot of people didn't breastfeed because I, I think I would share breastfeeding photos of Aram, he was two and it just didn't seem like anything. Um, and that's when I would start talking about it a little bit more. So I, that's when I started to understand that there was a lack of a support in it. And so I didn't realize how, how much hate there was. Um, and so doing the time cover was, I didn't care at all about that. So it wasn't something where I was scared to show people or I thought it was, it was weird. So I had no problem doing it. Um, and so it was, that sort of boldness was kind of, um, fun for me, I guess, in some ways. I didn't know the photo they were going to choose, but just ha having, being breastfeeding my, my three-year-old three on the cover was like, that was no big deal. So you've written your book, Modern Attachment Parenting, and you talk in there about some of the trauma that you went through after the time cover. And I'd like to hear a little bit about that. I would love to hear about your book. And I also want to hear about what do you think? It's almost a decade later, and now there are covers everywhere with celebrities, breastfeeding, social media is now more prominent. We have all kinds of social media outlets and breastfeeding mothers are just out there in droves with uh, you know, breastfeeding toddlers on the beach with their bikinis pulled down. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's like you broke some really serious ground, Jamie, and everybody just said, okay, the gate is open. We're all going through now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I, it's fun looking back at it because I didn't know if it, I was really 
really worried it was going to it was going to actually hurt the advocacy that we were trying so hard to move forward um just because of the shot that they they chose and how angry people got at first um especially mothers who couldn't breastfeed that that was upsetting to me um but um looking at it now i'm i'm really proud of of what it's done. And um, I think that those conversations were started. And because of that, you do, you see it all. It's just, you you see it all over social media. I love the fact that the more people show it, the more normalized it's become. So you see toddlers breastfeeding and no one says anything about that anymore. Um, you see women, all oh, basically every single social media influencer is breast, regardless of whether or not they breastfeed for very long, or even if it's just their one shot, Everything, everything that we talk about makes it, makes everyone feel, I think, seen and heard and, um, and not ostracized or alone. So at an early age, my mother did a lot of in-home breastfeeding support. So I've always seen breastfeeding. I've, it's always been a part of my life. I didn't choose to be an advocate until after law school, where I learned and acquired skills and degrees that I knew that I could be helpful in the workspace. I had always, or for a long time, wanted to be an advocate for others. So I've always wanted to help if somebody was sick, if someone was poor, if someone was hungry, I've always wanted to help that person. But this lactation field specifically, I was introduced to at an early age with my mother. It was only through the science, learning about the disparities and seeing that this is something I can dedicate either my whole self or a large majority of my professional self into the work and it be a meaningful thing that I want it to be a part of. Also my parents' history, my dad's a neonatologist. I have a twin sister who's now in the medical field, two older sisters who are both school teachers and a little brother who is interested also in helping with disparity. So as a family unit, we knew that we could give something back to our communities, whether that was through tutoring or through our advocacy of keeping babies alive and mothers near, um, healthy. And the barriers that you're looking at uh, with Robe, how are the fathers, or how are they receptive to breastfeeding? Yes, they love it. Fathers absolutely love it. And that's why I'm passionate about the job that I have. I tell people when I travel that I don't feel like a used car salesman or someone trying to push a limit or something that I don't believe is something that they would uh, benefit from. So fathers love it. A lot of times I hear, how can I do the job that you have? So a lot of fathers see it as job creation or, or career path mm -hmm. that instead of me being in an assembly line or instead of me being a, being a a piece of a larger machine that I don't get to control or have any um, influence on the output. Instead, in this fatherhood work or by encouraging breastfeeding or encouraging being a pillar of my community, I now can get paid to provide and look out for our legacy or for my legacy, which is usually a, a large motivation for men. So, so when I tell a father that their daughter is less likely to um, have to fight against breast cancer if she breastfeeds and that significant other is less likely to fight against breast cancer, huge push, a, a huge push. They love that. When I tell them their children could be smarter and healthier, deal with less um, uh, health concerns such as asthma or, or other concerns that they themselves may have. So I have asthma and I was breastfed. So had I not been breastfed, my asthma could have been worse or could be worse to this day. So even when we discuss, you know, realistically and practically, breastfeeding can't completely eliminate every woe in the world. It can dramatically, significantly, scientifically proven, reduce a lot of those obstacles. Fathers are very much on board. They, they want the best for their child, they want the best for their loved ones, and they see themselves as being a, a component because we talk about all fatherhood aspects in this work, in the breastfeeding work. So if a father's homeless, it's gonna be hard for him to advocate for breastfeeding. If a father's unemployed, if a father himself doesn't have health insurance, if a father's not literate. So by working with these men on helping their children, I also get to help them in here what else they need. 
is transportation an issue in your in your community? You might have a breastfeeding center or a healthy start or other advocates of breastfeeding near you, but if you can't get to them because they're 40 minutes away and you don't have a vehicle, then that's not helpful. So we got to learn the impact of telehealth and how powerful social media can be both in entertainment, but also education. If I can set up a Zoom call and help a father learn about breastfeeding, learn about the issues his significant other may be having while trying to breastfeed or connect them with healthcare professionals who can you know, help them in that field, they love it. And it builds a trust, it builds that relationship piece where now this father may have another skill that he wants to bring to fatherhood. He might be a graphic artist and can make flyers for other people's events. He may be a radio host um, or a journalist like yourself who can spread the good message about what's going on to educate or to increase the awareness for those who just don't know. So I do feel like some people just don't know. And that for me is still you know, unfortunate with the age of internet that we are in now and the age of, of um, socialization. But you know, even with people who are 40, 50, 60, and not as capable or do not know as much as the internet has to provide. That's one issue. So those are some barriers, just um, how familiar someone is with new technology. So I'm sure there are new companies and new apps that promote these things that I may not even be familiar with. So just kind of in increasing awareness, but fathers love this work. So no kitaru tatasati tata chik stariku stone go uh Jeshala and Sekoha, Jaha Jakados, um hello again. It's good to visit with you. Um my name is Jaisha Lyon Sekoha and I'm an intertribal love song. I'm an enrolled member of the Seminole Nation and um a descendant of the Pawnee Creek Omaha and Iowa tribes. Um I currently reside in Indian Territory, also known as Oklahoma. And I'm a parent of four babies, um, three of which I was able to uh, nurse directly. Um, I'm also two spirit and I'm a practicing birth worker as well as a student midwife. And then a grad student at uh, the University of Oklahoma's College of Law, um, the Master of Legal Studies in Indigenous Peoples Law. Um, I think at my heart within my, my soul, my chiksu, as we say, um, I'm just a good troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I ask a lot of questions um, because I uh, am an active participant in my world, in my community. And so when I do see something that um, seems to be like a barrier or a challenge, um, I kind of want to know, like, what's the reason? You know, why, why is it happening this way? Is, is there another way it could be done? Um, and I can't get my mind to stop that. So, um, so as a, a parent who my the second time I became a parent, um, I was uh, able to have a successful um, indigenous or milk medicine journey with my child. Um, I was able to to heal a lot um, from that experience. Uh, my current spouse and I, um, we were both with other people before we got together. So we already had a blended family. And when we decided to have children together, um, I told him right away, I'm having a home birth. And it just blew his mind because even though we're both native, we're both very grounded in our, our culture, um, that part of our culture was not practiced abundantly. And it's still not. Um, those lessons, those, those songs, those words are still kind of yet to be found or yet to be called back. Um, I don't believe that they're lost forever. I just believe that they're just underground or, you know, where they need to be right now until, until we're able to bring them back. Um, and so I was able to really navigate um, what home birth looked like for us as, um, as these native people that were, you know, reclaiming this space, um, reclaiming this ceremony. And, um, the research that again I had the I I did put into it to ensure that a provider um, could meet our needs because uh, initially those providers that I had sought uh, were not there like um, anything anybody that was um, of my tribal community anybody that was native but not of my specific heritage um, and then if they are they were there they were states away as we know <laughs> know these places to be called you know several hundreds 
uh, or even thousands of miles away from where I live in Indian territory. And I do live in a very rural community where we are very um, underserved, if not historically excluded um, in resources uh, related to healthcare uh, equity. So, um, you know, again, I, I researched uh, about that relationship uh, with uh, nursing my child with providing that indigenous milk medicine to my baby. Um, you know, I looked again into uh, the mechanics more um, than I could have done the first time. I didn't even know what to look for the first time. I just, you know, just thought baby to breast. And we, you know, many of us in this lactation space know that's, you know, definitely um, reduction, you know, reductive of what happens. Um, it was in all that research that I also was noticing there wasn't very much though um, regarding like this, you know, information I want to present on my behalf <laughs> and advocating for myself further in that workspace um, that I couldn't pull too much from tribal nations. I couldn't pull too much from at the national level either of like what it is for us as native people um, in that lactation space. Um, and the visibility was was very, very few and far between, and it's especially limited to people who were, I guess, my shade or lighter on the native spectrum um, and who very much look like uh, women or people with, um, you know, what we would identify as breasts, you know, like the imagery was just not inclusive um, as well as not abundant. Um, and so then I started working with uh, or trying to work with uh, my state's um, breastfeeding coalition uh, on like what they were doing for native people, like what they have done, what they could have done. Cause I knew they did policy um, and they still haven't tried to, to, to really bridge that, um, I guess, inner tribal interaction um, with what the work that they're doing, you know, no um, comment there necessarily, but just, um, yeah, even then it, they didn't have it. Um, and so when I was seen, raising awareness of, of um, different groups who have been um, disrupted in their uh, milk medicine journeys, you know, such as uh, African Americans or Black Americans, you know, um, us as Native Americans or Indigenous peoples, even um, uh, like the Latin X or um, Hispanic community. Um, it just was like with the data, uh, with the data they were taking and with the groups that are like, um, have the highest disparities, like what more could be done? Oh, Black Breastfeeding Week has a week, researching them and the founders and what they had been doing and wondering why, like, where, where is our week as Native people, as Indigenous people, um, hitting up my state's coalition and asking them about running this week. Um, here in Oklahoma specifically because we have 39 tribal uh, jurisdictions with a lot more native people than that here that reside in the state and kind of getting nowhere, getting dead ends. Um, reached out to a nonprofit organization that I had inter interviewed with before about um, nursing or breastfeeding and uh, we attempted to launch it together and they kind of just ghosted me <laughs> and so I was kind of left with this these work these ideas try to you know talk to the to the entities that I thought I needed to and just took it on my own and reached out to friends reached out to these folks that I actually work with now um through Indigenous Milk Medicine Collective which sponsors the week um like initially it just started as like a social media campaign right like just awareness um this is what we look like this is who we are this is the data that's out there these are the barriers that out that's out there also these are the reasons why there are these barriers and it just connected i guess like um you know just a just a fight for uh I guess for justice, <laughs> fight for um, visibility, turn, like um, in my own space, in my own life, turned into like this um, vibration amongst other folks who had been in the same circumstances. And we, some of us were able to band together to really amplify like what we have been going through, but also the joy and the beauty of our, um, I guess, resilience and of our culture. 
Um, and so that's uh, essentially how, uh, as it was called then, Native Breastfeeding Week came to be. Um, and then in its third year, we have uh, renamed ourselves Indigenous Milk Medicine Week um, because we recognize that uh, not only is Native breastfeeding um, that terminology very gendered, it, it also doesn't exactly convey everything that we're doing here, right? Like we're not just talking about um, the nuts and bolts or the mechanics of, you know, humans nursing their children or feeding their children. We're talking about these political, you know, disruptions, these cultural disruptions, um, social disruptions that um, were very systematic, intentionally systematic. Um, and I think that's the consciousness that you're talking about. It's like our work is, um, in collaboration with these other, you know, native um, folks, these other um, black folks, like all these people who have been on the ground in our various communities, you know, trying to create, um, I guess, a quality of life that our people so deserve. And we have just, you know, in our own ways, um, continue to, to, to raise up the, um, to, to continue to try to raise up the consciousness of our people. I feel like for me, the more of my people, my native people that can live in the dreamscape, the better we are. So your way around these barriers over, under, through, <laughs> was to integrate this considerable amount of education that you have in women's studies and somatic psychology as used in theater and the arts and theater of the oppressed and your motherhood experience and specifically your breastfeeding experience. And you put all of this into the creation of Milk Drunk. So can you tell us about this way around these barriers that, that you created? Well, the, the play that was eventually written started off uh, as a very personal document. So in, in really in the, the early hours, um, still in the hospital, I was compelled to write down the details of the, the crazy night I had had before. Um, my, my birth was induced. It all happened very quickly. I sort of tore through the stages. Um, there was some birth trauma. My daughter had to be revived. It was all happening at 4 a.m. There was a wild thunderstorm and snow and cars, alarms going off in the parking lot. It was this, it was sort of all the makings, you know, I'm a theater person, all the makings of a, you know, ecstatic, uh, you know, Grecian, <laughs> uh, you know, theatrical event. Um, um, and I was, I was just compelled as a storyteller to like write this down. I didn't want to miss a thing. Um, but then over the months and then over that first year, it turned into a document. Um, and the, the sort of recurring refrain through it all was like, nobody tells you this. They don't tell you. Like I'd read everything. I'd read so many books. Nobody tells you. Nobody tells you about the, um, you know, that in the first, in the, sometime within the first 10 days, there's going to be a time when like the baby is just ravenously hungry. And you think, you think I just fed you five minutes ago. Why is this still happening? Like um, nobody tells you about the smells, like sort of a bestial musk <laughs> as a nursing mom, you know, the, the let down being letting down in the middle of a, the diaper aisle at Rite Aid, you know, and uh, as we were leaving the hospital, like, um, and it's, and I'm, it's really, it's like the agonies and the ecstasies. Um, it took me forever to, you know, I, I talked to every breastfeeding consultant they sent my way in the hospital and it still took me weeks and weeks and a lot of pain and bleeding and chafing to explore that lean back method, the anthropological breastfeeding. Um, and, and also I think it, I, I feel fortunate that early on I did find a community. Um, and that was where, uh, I had a taste, my first taste of what felt like, oh, this, this is biocultural coherence. <laughs> um, mothers in a circle telling stories, sharing tips, watching each other, hearing each other, watching children of all ages interact, like, oh, seeing a vision. You know, my little 
<laughs> bald little squealing little kitten, you know, like is going to turn into that really soon, like seeing yourself on a trajectory. And then that the pride of, you know, being a, being a first or second, um, you know, <laughs> trimester mother postpartum, you know, the, the fourth and fifth trimester, you know, being able to, to welcome into the group, a new mother, perhaps who's, who's having challenges. Um, so that was a, really the community um, was, was one thing and uh, which became an opportunity to sell stories. Um, also, you know, I was probably just weeks out of the hospital t telling everybody who would listen, I'm gonna make a play, this is so crazy, colostrum, this, like this, the, the nursing that holds the conflict of information, like the baby, the sounds, like this is so crazy. Like there's, no one's telling you about this. I'm gonna write a play, I'm gonna call it Milk Drunk. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and in the end, you know, I threw my hat over the ring, applied for a new work development, new play development program, um, made a commitment, and then uh, and it essentially ended up kind of in my, in every hour, every waking hour I had sort of putting, penning, um, the details of, of what I was living through. Um, there's, there's a picture I sent you, Lisa, of myself uh, pumping backstage opening night of Milk Drunk, you know, subtitled, an actor prepares. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's I, really the, the story and then the opportunity um, to engage with, with families, to engage with mothers, to engage with partners, um, to engage with elders, um, also practitioners, healthcare providers, um, nurses, uh, you know, a chaplain who works at one of the major hospitals in my area came to, to see a show. Um, so those, those conversations ended up also being very kind of reinforcing for me uh, the importance of the play, um, that, that breastfeeding and motherhood is not a niche subject, that this is something that, that um, it is an appropriate subject matter for a mainstream theatrical stage. Um, and, uh, and I've been really excited to, that, you know, that, that there's the outer community too, of the, the creative arts community and the performing arts community. And really, even within the last year, um, the last couple of years, there's been a movement in our field um, inside of, uh, honestly, the conversation of racial justice, of pay equity, of uh, inside of the Me Too movement, harassment, looking at motherhood, new motherhood, parental support, um, and related issues like family leave, uh, elder care, uh, really looking at our field of the performing arts and, and finding, identifying where is this, where is the field prohibitive, um, you know, to this whole sector of our population. Um, and there's been this kind of under, you know, lie, this story that, that the performing arts is kind of a young person's game. And it really doesn't have to be that way. And we're, we're depriving ourselves as a field and also as a public who's consuming these stories um, uh, when we exclude a whole part of our population. Um, so there's, there's ongoing activism in that area. Um, and, uh, and I've just been, been proud to have my, my little story, my piece to be a part of this larger movement as well. It's, um, it's an honor. <laughs> So thank you so much, Patty, for coming on and talking with me. Um, Absolutely. I can't wait to hear your story. And you can start out by talking to us about um, your first exposure to breastfeeding. Uh, sadly, I didn't have much first exposure. I was formula fed as a child, not even just formula. My mother fed me caro syrup and evaporated milk. So even worse than formula. Um, and I didn't really have much exposure. And uh, when my first child was born, none of my friends, I had one friend who'd had a baby, but she didn't breastfeed. And I just, I guess I just innately knew that was the best thing for, for my child that, you know, that's what I was supposed to do. These breasts are on my body for a purpose, not just for decoration. And I, I really just got lucky that things went well with her. Uh, we didn't really have any problems. Um, and, and really it was a, it was a success. Um, I guess the, the biggest issue for me, like going on down the line, three babies later, <clears throat> is that I, I felt strongly about child-led weaning, about 
um, letting them nurse until they they were they said they were done. And without the support of other mothers around me, I don't know if I could have done that because my children ended up wanting to nurse for a very long time. My last one was four and a half. And, uh, you know, I, of course I got a lot of sideways looks and, but without the support of my, my friends and my fellow mothers, I don't think I could have followed through with the child led weaning and have it be that successful for that long. <laughs> So that was a barrier, uh, trying to find support for child-led weaning and what's also known as full-term breastfeeding, which, uh, you know, average age of weaning, uh, should we follow our homo sapien path to wellness is around four, four and a half and can yep. go as long as seven and eight years. So Correct. what did you do about that barrier, Patty? How'd you go around it, over it, under it, through it? Uh, that's a really good question. And, and I, again, just kind of dumb luck. I didn't have like-minded friends at the time i happened to go to the grocery store and i found a loose leaf sheet of paper hanging on a bulletin board with uh her name was brenda and she said looking for other moms interested in raising children holistically need support and i went me too so i tore off the little tab underneath and i called brenda and <clears throat> we got together in her backyard and I invited another friend and she invited two friends. And before we knew it, we had a group called Mothering Friends that was the backbone to my experience as a mother and to many other women in the same city. But sadly, I mean, that was 30 years ago. That was before the internet. That was before, you know, it, things were more accessible. We had to do things the old school way, which is, you know, tear off a thing at the grocery store. And I just was so, fortunate that I just stumbled upon that, but it shouldn't have to be such a random occurrence to find support. It should be more accessible for for women. This, am I making sense? Yes. <laughs> and, and this, so this is, uh, you know, you, you were a part of the early mothering friends and you moved from Virginia Beach to Williamsburg I did. and became a part of the, uh, the families for natural living is what it was yeah. originally. You're one of the founding board members uh, at that time. It was a very different world back then as far as uh, home, home birth was still um, illegal, you know, quote unquote yes. states. Homeschooling parents were a little afraid of being uh, um, um, arrested even for Correct. schooling and keeping their children out of school. And then, you know, this is where I met you and I, I came into the Families for Natural Living Circle of Moms in the Park and that the story that I've told for 23 years now, I'll just tell it. I'll just tell it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just that, um, I come into this, uh, you know, I had a high risk pregnancy. I had um, uh, been in my house and in my head about what is it to be a mother, checking all the boxes, reading the books, uh, making sure, am I doing this the right way? So when I was invited to come to this group, um, I had to drive to get there from Williamsburg for one thing. That was a big deal, put my baby in the car, go that far, but I was desperate for community. I could feel it, you know, the salmon going up the river uh, yes. feeling. And, uh, and I, I, got take, I remember taking my son out of his little car seat, putting him in the little wheelie, which is funny now because we know all about attachment parenting. You know, I put him in a little, <laughs> little stroller, I wheel him over, I sit down, I, I turn away shyly a nurse and, and turn back around to this group. And I, I finally arrive in this group and start to settle in. And it really was, you, you all had a huge group of moms back then. We did. Uh, you know, we did. 40 moms in this big circle. And what I saw and experienced was mothers who were comfortable in their bodies, relaxed, uh, nursing babies, uh, nursing toddlers. And I remember this moment when uh, a toddler came running through the middle of the circle, I think a two or three year old jumped into your lap. It was your lap at the time. I don't know if he lifted your shirt or you lifted your shirt, but you didn't miss a beat and kept talking to the other moms and passing food and just, and it was that embodiment of such uh, confidence and knowing what you were doing did something. And I, I, for years said, I don't care if you call it somatic psychology, 
quantum physics or monkey see, monkey do. But Patty Ogden, your Patty Ogden's <laughs> breasts, <laughs> like, like unleashed this, uh, you know, pushed me across this threshold into motherhood that I knew what I was. And I had this big aha, this DNA moment happened and I unfolded and I was like, oh, I'm a mom, <laughs> I'm a mother. I had, you know, my son there. I was like, oh, we're going to be okay now. But that group of um, mothers and, and dads came eventually uh, and, and some of the meetings uh, was, uh, felt like a life raft to me for yes. so long. Yes. I had to have that to survive and to, and to have backup for what you were describing, which was, I just felt innately like I have to do this. Yes. Uh, also child-led weaning full term. And, um, and, and that coming across any of that kind of whole child wellness model at that time was not, well, it just wasn't mainstream and we didn't have the internet. Right. Thank Correct. you, Patty. Well, Thank I'm you, so Patty's happy breasts. That, I'm so happy that my breasts made such a large impact on you. <laughs> <laughs> and I too, with the support of that group, just that simple, just sitting around in a circle, um, and having that support, I mean, it, it actually pushed us, you and I, and several other women to go on into more activist roles. Um, and I definitely would not have had that backbone had it not been for those, those groups, those, the, the support, um, the community. It's crucial. It is I crucial. Think. Yeah, for this series, Kamari Bug said that uh, the way she and uh, women in the Black community who she talks about being so exhausted have kept up their stamina is by the, she says, the oxytocin available to you in community is like that oxytocin you get through breastfeeding. And yes. that is <laughs> a, big, <laughs> a crucial piece to stamina and keeping on keeping going uh, for, for breastfeeding advocacy or anything. Um, but I, I think, you know, what I really wanted to point out here at this, um, this part of the series is that, that you and I are women who have been, our children are grown and gone now. Yes. We were waiting a long time for the big systemic pieces to drop, to support us in uh, public um, policies that would support families in this country. What we didn't know at that time, a quarter of a century ago, is America was in the middle of a fall to the bottom of a 50-year fall to mm. all international indices for maternal child wellness, infant health and wellness, adult wellness now. Um, so this salmon swimming upstream feeling that I had and felt uh, was uh, empowered in a group of women um, nursing uh, has stayed with me. And, yes, and I and so because this is for the La Leche League conference, I just felt like I needed to be able to present this piece and say, you know, everybody I've interviewed have talked about these big systemic pieces that need to change. But what are we going to do in the meantime when our kids are growing up and we need support now? And La Leche right. League does offer that. You yes, know, it it matters a lot. It, it does. I attended many, many La Leche League meetings back in my early mothering days and, and even advanced mothering days because I felt at that point, after I had successfully breastfed three children into their toddler years, um, uh, that, that I, you called it earlier, a mentoring mom. And I felt like from what I received back in my early days, I wanted to give back to those new mothers. So I kept going to those meetings even though you know I'd already had three successful experiences, but I just wanted to help, uh, not just with the breastfeeding, I, I actually took it further from the support I got from the, those early days. I um, became a childbirth instructor, I became a doula. Uh, I worked with two home birth midwives, attended many home births, um, went on to be a labor and delivery nurse myself. And uh, so I, I, again, I don't know without the, that support early on. I mean, it was life life changing, and that's and I'm not saying that lightly. It it changed the course of my life. I was a teacher before. <laughs> I was a second grade teacher, and uh, I and I made a complete 180 in my life. And it's been it's been a fabulous career, and um, 
and being able to help women in the hospitals who are on the fence about breastfeeding. And all I need is that little crack in the door and I'm walking through that crack. I'm going to, I'm going to open that door for them and, and give them as much support as I can. Cause those first days are so important for establishing a healthy breastfeeding relationship. And I'm, I'm there for that. And I still continue to work for that for women and for babies. Thank you so much, Patty. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you for everything you have done and continue to do. And I look forward to showing your uh, pictures of you uh, rock climbing <laughs> at the beginning of this uh, because you're, you get to do the go around the country and work in different hospital settings. So you probably have quite a bit of a uh, number of stories to tell about that experience. But, but you're there. They don't even know what's coming through the door when, they, when Patty Cornwall shows up to support <laughs> all <the> babies. <laughs> do they? <laughs> no, they do not. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for joining me and our Wayfinders for this series in Breaking Barriers and Breastfeeding Advocacy. Don't forget, you have the entire nine interviews to enjoy on this link, as well as a PDF hyperlinking the resources presented. Please feel free to contact me at editor at kindredmedia.org with your questions about kindred activism or anything else. And please visit our website at kindredmedia.org for more information.